All right, sorry about that. Uh, we are recording audio. It just doesn't look like it, unfortunately. It's not giving my, me my usual signal that I'm recording audio. All right, positive and negative feedback systems. With homeostasis, you have a sensor that detects an internal state, a control center that integrates that information, and an effector that the control center initiates the effect for, and that effector is going to alter that original input. So our big example for that back in the day was temperature. If your skin receptors detect that you are cold, for example, that information is sent via a sensor to your brain, to the control center, and then that's going to send out effectors along things like skeletal muscle to cause you to shiver, or smooth muscle like the erector pili muscle that straightens up the hair on your arm to help keep you warm. And the idea is that we're going to return to baseline temperature with those effectors. Does that all sound familiar? That, does that change, like, if you are used to going and living in Florida or something oh, yeah. really warm and then you come here, so it edits the end of the Um, So right now this is about homeostasis in general, where we're just reviewing general homeostasis. Um, what you're talking about is set points. So we all have internal set points where our temperature is supposed to be about 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, right? Um, there are things that are altered depending on if you live in the Arctic tundra versus the tropical rainforest. Uh, ideally, we keep that temperature about the same, but we alter other physical parameters and potentially using the endocrine system, absolutely. So um, you can hold that thought for now, and then when we get to patho, we'll talk about allosteric load and how we react to extremes, uh, long-term extremes, and how that alters our physiology long-term. Yep. It's a really great question. All right, so that was homeostasis in general, and endocrine system is going to be a great effector of that homeo those homeostatic mechanisms. These are going to be great for homeostasis. So for a negative feedback system, which is what we just saw with homeostasis in general, a really good example for that is going to be how the pancreas controls glucose levels. We're going to get a little bit more specific, specific than temperature. We're going to say that um, if your blood sugar is low, your system is going to cause you to eat food. And when you eat food, your blood glucose will rise, it will increase. There are going to be sensors in your pancreas that detect this rise in blood sugar. And the response to that, the effector is going to be an increase in insulin. That release of the hormone insulin is going to have a receptors in a variety of places. Um, and they're going to cause cells to move glucose transporters to the cell surface. And that's going to cause the movement of glucose from the bloodstream into the cells. And when that glucose is in cells and not in the bloodstream, your blood sugar goes back down. So we went from high blood sugar and we brought it back down to low blood sugar. Now we're back down to low blood sugar and we get the signal to eat again. So it, it went up and went down, it went up and went down. And that's that cycle. So that's just a hormonal cycle that controls a, a homeostatic mechanism. With a couple of hormones, you also have positive feedback system. Um, your textbook uses a weird phrase here. It says that, it's a, um, the, that these are rare in humans. That's not quite accurate. Uh, they are they're happening in very specific circumstances. They're very normal. Uh, it's not quite right to say they're rare. There just aren't as many of them as there are negative feedback systems. So examples of positive feedback, uh, the general concept is the stimulus increases the response and it keeps increasing and increasing and increasing until the original stimulus is gone. So there's one sort of real world example of this. I don't think it's on this PowerPoint though. Um, the running of the bulls, right? Uh, the bulls come out, people start running. More bulls, more people running, right? It, it just gets crazier and crazier until all the bulls are gone. Makes sense, right? So a couple of examples of this in human, uh, the milk letdown response for nursing for lactation is one of these feed forward systems. As long as the baby is suckling, we produce more and more uh, oxytocin until that, babe, that stimulus, the baby suckling, is gone. And it keeps increasing and increasing. So it never is trying to return to baseline. 
It's just going to keep going until the stimulus is gone. Same thing for labor, and also oxytocin is present there as well. Um, the labor is initiated physiologically, oxytocin increases, labor continues, oxytocin increases, it increases, it increases until the baby is actually born, and then it can stop. Um, works for you guys? We're good on that? It's not the hardest concept ever. Uh, this also works for things like hemostasis, blood clotting is a positive feedback system. It's just on an endocrine system, positive feedback loop. Okay. One of the reasons that the neuro, neurological system ties into the endocrine system so thoroughly is that the hypothalamus, in addition to controlling the autonomic nervous system, also controls the endocrine system, and in some direct and some indirect ways as well. Some people call the hypothalamus the master gland. Some people call the pituitary the master gland. There's a reason that we have that sort of conflation. Now, I did tell you just a minute ago that neurons release neurotransmitters directly onto target cells, whereas glands release hormones directly into the bloodstream. There is one place that has an exception to both of these rules at the same time, and that is the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus has two groupings of cells, two nuclei, that release a substance into the bloodstream that acts as a hormone. So there are actually substances being released by um, neurons that act as hormones just in the hypothalamus, nowhere else. Otherwise, you should think about it the way I told you before. So the hypothalamus actually does release some hormones. Some of them will diffuse via this portal system, which we'll talk about a couple of portal systems this semester. And they will diffuse down to the anterior pituitary and cause the release of hormones from the anterior pituitary. And some of them, these two that are being demonstrated here, the neurons here, the axons, go through this stalk to the posterior pituitary and release those substances directly into the cardiovascular system. So there's a couple of things I have to point out here. First is that statement I used, portal system. We haven't even done cardiovascular yet. One thing we're going to learn about cardiovascular system is that blood pressure is based on the heart pump. The heart pumps blood out, and that is the pressure. The contraction of the heart pump is the blood pressure. At least that's a part of it. That's the initial part of it. When you get to capillary beds, things slow down. And the usual structure is that we go from the heart pump to large vessels, to small vessels, to capillary beds, and back up through smaller to larger vessels back to the heart. A portal system is when we go from a capillary bed to a larger vessel to another capillary bed. It is not a standard structure for the cardiovascular system. This is the first portal system you're going to see. We're going to see another portal system in the digestive system. And that is the clinical significance of it. We are carrying nutrients. We are carrying hormones in this case from one place to another. And the other significance is that this is going to be a slow, low-pressure system. If you can remember that till digestive, awesome. I will be really, really happy. Uh, the other thing I'm going to point out here is a little bit of anatomy. This stalk right here that connects the hypothalamus to the pituitary is called the infundibulum. And that will be on a slide coming up in a bit. It's a great word, infundibulum. It's got the word fun in it, so you're good, right? Infundibular stock. And you'll notice that I divided the anterior and posterior pituitary. They are slightly different. The anterior pituitary is glandular. The posterior pituitary is nervous tissue. So notice how these neurons are just continuing down here into the posterior pituitary. Histologically speaking, this is a continuation of brain tissue. This is nervous tissue. Whereas this, embryologically, came from something else entirely and joined up 
with this posterior pituitary, it is a gland. Uh, when you take it out of a brain, it has kind of the consistency of snot, and it kind of blah, 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 goes away really quickly. Um, that's kind of what glands are like. This is a pretty top-heavy lecture. The pituitary is doing so much stuff. We're going to spend about a third of our lecture time for this lecture just on the pituitary. Don't get overwhelmed by just the pituitary. Everything after that is like one or two hormones from each organ after that. I promise it's not as bad. So the hypothalamus secretes some regulatory hormones. One thing that you're going to see in the endocrine system is hormones that act on glands that release hormones that act on glands. We're going to have primary, secondary, tertiary glands in circuits. In just a couple of cases, it won't be overwhelming, hopefully. So when we say that the hypothalamus releases some regulatory hormones, they're all going to have words like releasing hormone or trophic hormone. Does anybody remember what trophic means? Mm, so atrophy would be to break down. So atrophy is to shrink from disuse. But uh, trophy, so hypertrophy, the, the, the positive trophy, what do we mean by trophy just in general? Yeah, so building, what it literally means is feeding. So when uh, something is trophic, when it's a trophic hormone, it means it's feeding into another hormone or it's feeding into another gland. It's moving things forward. So you're going to see things from the, the hypothalamus that are called, let's say, um, make sure I'm getting this one right. Yeah, thyroid releasing hormone. Thyroid releasing hormone is going to, for example, you don't need to know this right now, thyroid releasing hormone is going to cause the release of thyroid stimulating hormone. And then thyroid stimulating hormone is going to act on the thyroid gland to release thyroid hormone. So they're going to be in those cascades sometimes. And we're going to simplify it as much as we possibly can because it does get complicated. So most of what the hypothalamus releases is those regulatory, those trophic or releasing hormones. Otherwise, the ones that go feed into the posterior pituitary, there are only two hormones of the posterior pituitary. This is the easy part. They are oxytocin and antidiuretic hormone. So your first official hormones of the day are ADH and OT. Clinically speaking, you are allowed to use the acronym in medical terminology. You can just write ADH. That is acceptable. I like to say the entire word because it always tells you what it's doing. With few exceptions, oxytocin is maybe not that obvious, but antidiuretic hormone is pretty obvious. What do you think antidiuretic hormone is going to do? Yeah, it's going to keep you from peeing, exactly. <laughs> So you can actually use that terminology, you can use the linguistics to figure out precisely what it's doing 90% of the time, which is why I do recommend that you learn the names and not just the acronyms. But if it's on a lab practical and I say, give me a hormone of the posterior pituitary and you write the letters A, D, and H, you are good. You're fine. Um, so here are some of those releasing hormones from the hypothalamus. There's not too much detail. I would go back to your learning objectives to see how much detail you need to put into these. These are generally not my focus. But again, let's look at those patterns. Corticotropin releasing hormone. Um, some context for that is that you have an adrenal cortex. So if you are a corticotropic releasing hormone, what do you think your job would be? To feed the adrenal cortex, yes. exactly. So this is going to be part of a cascade that results in the release of hormones from the adrenal cortex. And then if you were trying to figure out what gonadotropin releasing hormone was going to do, what do you think it's going to cause the release of hormones from? Probably the gonads, yeah, exactly. 
Um, growth hormone releasing hormone, that one's pretty straightforward. What do we think that's doing? It's probably, yeah, it's probably causing the release of growth hormone. So, yay, <laughs> we figured it out. It really does not need to be harder than that. Don't make it harder than that. Okay, um, again, we're back to that anatomy. There's that hypothalamus. That optic chiasm is a little bit anterior. There's that infundibulum and its continuous nervous tissue between the hypothalamus and the posterior pituitary, whereas that anterior pituitary, the, that glandular tissue simply wraps around the infundibulum. And that is located in that hypophyseal fossa of the cella cursica of the sphenoid bone. Remember that guy? Yep, we emphasized him pretty hard. Which means two things. It means it's very centrally located in the cranial cavity. It means it's fairly well protected by that sphenoid bone. It also means it's in a very limited space. So if you've got a pituitary tumor, there's going to be some crushing pretty quick. It also means that if you do manage to break that sphenoid bone, that's going to be a concern, is that hormonal regulation. That is, this is literally controlling everything. Everything cascades down from here. The way I remember that the anterior pituitary is glandular is anterior glanterior. I didn't make it up. Somebody else did, but I thought it was good. Uh, recall that the pituitary is also known as the hypophysis, hence the terminology of that being the hypophyseal fossa right there. I'll stick with pituitary. You guys can stick with pituitary. Just be aware if you ever look into the literature, you may see the term hypophysis. And I don't care too much about the pars distalis, pars intermedia, and pars tuberalis. Uh, it's really histology based to differentiate those things. And back to that concept of the portal system. Again, we're going from a capillary bed to a larger vessel to another capillary bed. This is how those releasing hormones, those trophic hormones of the hypothalamus, are going to diffuse down and reach their targets in the anterior pituitary. Yes? So aside from ADH and oxytocin, it says that those are released in the posterior pituitary? That's correct. So Yes, so only two hormones released by the posterior pituitary. There's going to be seven from the anterior pituitary, which is why this is the heaviest bit we're doing today. Nothing else is as heavy as the anterior pituitary. All right, here's your seven. It looks like six. There's seven in here. And there's, there's your list right there, but we'll go from this picture, make it visual. First up, thyroid stimulating hormone. Make a guess what that does. Stimulates the thyroid, boom. Uh, prolactin. What do we think something that's called prolactin is going to be for? Yep, uh, not milk letdown. That's actually going to be a separate process between the formation of milk with prolactin. So prolactation, formation of milk. Oxytocin is milk let down, so the actual release of milk from those ducts is a separate process, controlled by oxytocin, which was from the posterior pituitary. Next you have ACTH, adrenocorticotropic hormone, and go ahead and make a guess about what that's doing. It does act on the adrenal cortex, absolutely. And we will get to that adrenal gland, so by the end of the day, you will know what those adrenal cortex hormones are. Growth hormone, what do we think that's going to cause? Probably growth, and you're going to have receptors for that all over the place. Same with thyroid, uh, sorry, not, uh, we're not a thyroid hormone yet. Growth hormone is going to have receptors all over, especially uh, fat cells, muscle cells, skeletal cells. FSH and LH will make more sense at the end of the semester than they will today. During week nine, we're going to tell you what the follicle is and what the luteal body is. Until then, 
you're going to have to take my word for it that follicle stimulating hormone is going to stimulate the follicle, <laughs> which basically for now means it's going to help your eggs to develop prior to ovulation. And luteinizing hormone is actually going to trigger ovulation as well in women. Uh, and it's then going to support something called the luteal body that helps um, with, let's say, for now, simplify it, fertilization and um, conception in general. Yeah, that's a bad way to put it. In men, men also have FSH and LH, obviously. Biological men do not have ovaries and oocytes and follicles and luteal bodies. So what it's going to do in men is it's, they're both going to stimulate spermatogenesis, the formation of sperm. LH is also going to increase testosterone, which also increases production of sperm. So if you want to keep it simple, FSH and LH in men just increase the production of sperm. Which is why this is two right here. FSH and LH are separate hormones. They have similar activities in terms of fertility. Finally, melanocyte stimulating hormone, MSH, that's going to stimulate your melanocytes. Are we surprised by that? Nope. Okay. So the pattern emerges. It doesn't have to be that bad, right? There is something in endocrinology I should warn you about. Again, I will stay consistent with my terminology. If you go out into the literature, almost every hormone has multiple names. In fact, antidiuretic hormone has at least three names that I know of, personally. Let's go back to um, ADH real quick. So you're going to focus on ADH because of its antidiuretic properties. It's going to be very important when we get to kidneys at the end of the semester, week 10. You may have heard of it as vasopressin before, arginine vasopressin. And a uh, fun fact, somebody discovered it in a rodent known as an agouti. So it's also the agouti-related hormone. ARH. So it's got a lot of names. A lot of these things do have a lot of names. I'm going to stick with ADH. I actually initially learned it as AVP, which I remembered because of Alien versus Predator really well. So we did this cascade already. Now that we've seen these two first two hormones, let's go over it again. Recall that that hypothalamus is going to release thyroid releasing hormone. And the target of that is the anterior pituitary. In response to TRH, the anterior pituitary releases TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, which is then going to go to the thyroid. And that thyroid will be stimulated to release thyroid hormones. We're just going to call them thyroid hormones. There are a couple of different forms of thyroid hormone known as, for example, T3 and T4. We're not going to worry too much about the differences between T3 and T4. In general, at any point, if you have highly elevated TSH, that's going to cause a negative feedback system. If it's elevated, that's going to cause the hypothalamus to decrease the release of TRH. If your thyroid hormone is too elevated, that is going to be part of a negative feedback loop, and you're, it's going to tell your hypothalamus to decrease the release of TRH. We're going to leave it at that for now, but I want you to keep that in mind as you move towards patho because we're going to have things like, for example, hypothyroidism. And if you're not releasing thyroid hormone, then you won't have that negative feedback to the hypothalamus, and you may continue to elevate your TRH and TSH despite having low thyroid hormone. So that's just something to think about, not something to learn this moment. Did that make sense? Uh, we're going back to, here's the nucleus that produces oxytocin, here's the nucleus that produces ADH. I'm not going to have you learn these nucleus names. You don't need to know the paraventricular nucleus or the superoptic nucleus. Um, they're cool. You can learn them if you want. I'm not going to test you on them. 
All right, any questions about the hormones of the pituitary gland? Again, that oxytocin, actually let's do some cleanup on oxytocin. It is the milk letdown response. It does initiate labor. The physiology of labor is rather complex. If any of you have kids, you already know that. It's also the cuddle hormone. So if you're snuggling with somebody that you love, it increases your love and bond for that person, uh, which is pretty cool. That's part of the reason that you know women have more than one kid, even though labor is so painful. It's because you go through this process of physical labor, your oxytocin is through the roof, and then your child is born and you're just full of this love chemical. Like all, you have all of the love for your child right then. Yes? Is that why they encourage skin to skin right after labor? That's a big part of it, yes. There's a lot of skin to skin contact that frankly we don't even understand why it's so effective, but oxytocin and the bonding process are definitely part of that, yes. <laughs> And then, of course, ADH, antidiuretic hormone. Specifically, it's going to target your kidney tubules. The word tubules is going to make sense during week 10 to stimulate water retention. Again, there's some things you're going to see today that's more of a preview for things to come. If you can hang on to them all through the semester, awesome you are going to be reminded of them throughout the semester. We'll get to the renal system and I will say, all right, ADH is going to target this part of the kidney tubule right here. Do you guys remember ADH? And some of you are going to be like, yes, and some of you are going to be no. Yes, you have a question over here? Um, yeah, at some point you said the posterior pituitary also goes to the cardiac um, system, but I don't see the heart on this picture. I don't remember Do saying cardiac system. So Maybe I did. It'll be in the YouTube thing. You can rub it in my face if you find it later. <laughs> oh, the portal system. So obviously the cardiovascular system is connected uh, to the heart in, it, in its entirety. Okay. The idea with the portal system is that you don't have the heart pump immediately behind it. You've gone from a capillary bed to a larger vessel to a capillary bed, and the heart pump is very far away from that. So it's oh. going to be a low pressure system and it's going to be slow. I see what you're talking about. Thank you for that point of clarification. That helps. All right, because oxytocin is a snuggle hormone, there's been some really, really weird research about it. Let's talk about montane and prairie voles. Yay, it's my favorite part. Um, I had a really fun endocrinology class, by the way. It was just the most fun ever. So, power of oxytocin. There are real physiological purposes to having oxytocin. So. Any mammal that has labor and milk down, milk letdown responses is going to have the same level of oxytocin in its population. What we've already learned today is that a hormone can't act on specific tissues unless there are receptors for it. So these are voles. They're very similar subspecies to each other. There's the montane subspecies and the prairie subspecies. And physiologically, they're very, very similar. Behaviorally, they're very different. The prairie voles have uh, the male of the species be very nurturing. They create pair bonds. They nurture their offspring. The montane voles are players. They do not form pair bonds. They just have orgies and do not care. They don't nurture their children. So they thought, well, maybe they have different oxytocin levels. That was incorrect. They have different distributions of oxytocin receptors. They have the substance. They don't have the pair bond effect the way that the prairie voles have the pair bond effect. So um, the way that I connect this to human behavior is maybe you have an ex who just could not stay loyal. There might have been something physiological to that. Um, so obviously, there's a lot of individual variation for people and their receptor distribution for oxytocin. Cool, right? Yeah, that's a good story. Okay, there's a nice summary slide for your pituitary gland hormones in case you need a review. I'm pretty comfortable with that. Uh, how are we feeling about pituitary? Do you have, let's take a couple of minutes, see if there are any questions, because we're about to move on to thyroid and I'd rather stay here for a second. Let's go through the two for the posterior pituitary. What are the two for the posterior pituitary? ADH and? Oxytocin. You can write that as OT if you want. I recommend writing oxytocin. Okay, try to get the seven 
from the anterior pituitary. Not TRH, TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone. Growth hormone, good. Prolactin, good. Luteinizing hormone, LH. What's the other reproductive one? FSH, follicle stimulating hormone. Makes more sense when it gets reproductive. ACTH, adrenocorticotropic hormone, and uh, we already did LH as one of the reproductive. What's that? We already did prolactin, yep. It's a weird one. It goes to your skin. MSH, melanocyte stimulating hormone. I think that is the most frequently forgotten one. Absolutely. Good job. Um, okay. It's a weird time, but let's go ahead and go on break just a couple of minutes early.